Um, so what I am going to do, um, and I'm going to make no excuses for this, I'm going to uh, focus on what we do in synthetic air, in synthetic biology. And the, the bottom line is, if you don't get into the details, I don't mind. The bottom line is that we are learning how to engineer proteins from first principles to build more and more complex protein structures, architectures, assemblies, and hopefully systems. That's where we want to get to. That's why I think it is part of synthetic biology. Um, and the other thing is, I, I know we're being filmed and everything, um, and I know you've sl slotted 30 minutes for talk and 15 for discussion or whatever, but are you happy if I open the talk up to say people that want to stop me because they don't understand something can do that? Yeah, so please do interrupt me if there's something that you want to um, get off your chest there and then and uh, have me explain something. So, um, I'm, a, I'm a protein designer, a protein engineer, and that's the perspective I come from. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about is uh, what is synthetic biology, um, but that's been introduced very well, so I won't, I won't dwell on it. I'll just give you a few examples. Um, I'm going to tell you about our work in this area, which is to make peptide components for synthetic biology. Now, all, all absolutely every single peptide and protein I tell you about is designed de novo. So there are no natural peptides or proteins here. We borrow from, we steal from, we nick um, uh, principles and functions and things from, from natural biological pieces, but these are de novo designed molecules. And then I'm going to give you three examples of designed peptide-based materials. I'm going to give you three small examples. Sam, I'm sure, is going to give you a beautiful uh, um, discussion of, of, of how, you, how far you can take protein engineering and peptide engineering in the area of tissue engineering, I'm sure, tomorrow. Uh, and then, if I have time, that's why I put it in... Um, in um, grey here, and this is a slip up. I hope the rest of my slides aren't slipped as much as this. Um, I'm going to give you an insight into where we're going in, in terms of making new, totally new protein designs that aren't seen in biology. All right, so uh, this is just a picture. Um, it's a very uh, complicated, uh, busy slide. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm just, this, this is actually our first iteration of our synthetic biology space diagram that uh, Doug showed. So what is synthetic biology? Well, I'm going to borrow a very similar definition of synthetic biology, um, but this time, and I think the, the Research Council one, and the one that we've been using on the roadmap, has distilled largely from this. But this is taken from the website of Synthetic Biology Org. And it just simply states that synthetic biology is the design and construction of new biological parts, devices, and systems, and the redesign of existing natural biological systems for useful purposes. How else can we state that? Um, I think this is what we're trying to do in synthetic biology. We're trying to make the engineering of biological systems easier, more predictable, um, rely more reliable. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, I have discussions with Dick about this, uh, who's going next. I still think it's a bit of a hypothesis. I agree that, synthetic, that, that biology is modular. The question is, how well can we engineer that modularity? How, how well can we put these pieces together? I still think that's a hypothesis. I think it's worth bearing in mind. We can do it. As Dick points out quite rightly, we can build aeroplanes. Right? We may not understand every, everything about flight, but we can, we, can, we can do these things, and we should definitely do it. But I think it's going to be best founded on understanding. And the, the, the real reason that we got into this area is that as protein designers for 10, 15 years, we used to make all of our um, protein designs bespoke. So I'll talk about a project right at the end where we've made, um, again like Sam, draw, trying to draw in different people, um, um, which we, we had this idea of making biological fibres that would then make networks and make gels so that we can promote uh, cell growth in culture. Um, when we first set about that project, we designed that molecule in a, in, in a very bespoke way. So I sat down with a pen and paper and with a graduate student and we, dis we, we, we wrote a sequence down. Right? And we came up with quite a complex molecule. It worked. It was actually two molecules, and you'll see later on they worked. But they were definitely bespoke and they had lots of trimmings that we realised later we didn't need. And so the question I asked my group over the last five or so years was, can we reduce this, reduce this complexity down, remove the bespoke approach to design, and make uh, a series of components that we could use in different contexts? 
So we can characterize, so we can design them once, we can characterize them fully, and then we can go and plug them play in plug and play them into different contexts. And I think that's the spirit of synthetic biology, personally. All right, so here's that um, picture that um, Doug showed earlier on. We yeah, we published it some time ago actually in two journals. And I think it's been taken up um, reasonably well. But I should also emphasise that um, some people don't, do, don't agree with this, right? which is absolutely fine. Right? Um, I'm, I'm, qu I'm quite relaxed about that. Um, for us, it's actually quite a useful way of thinking about what synthetic biology is. And at the time, we were thinking about, are we synthetic biologists? Do we do this? And actually, in, uh, so we found it a useful process, but also it made us think about, as I say, how, how we do our science. And we wanted to do it in a non-bespoke way, a more, uh, more component-based way, an engineering approach to biological systems. So what, what is this picture all about? Um, so al along the y-axis, we have components of, increasingly, of increasing com uh, complexity in biologies. So down here, we might start with nucleotides or uh, amino acids or sugars or lipids, and then we increase the complexity. So in the case of nucleotides and amino acids, we put them together, as biology does, as polymers, and we instruct, and biology does this extremely well, it instructs its polymers to fold and contain information in very specific ways. And, I'll, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of polypeptides in a minute. So, so, so in this case, there's a polypeptide that's folded up into a helix. It can then dimerize into a quaternary structure of a protein, that's a, that's a self-assembled unit, but you can get those for nucleic acids, you can get them for more complex proteins. And then uh, self-assembled units that are, are, are not necessarily made out of polymers, but made out of, in this case, lipids can come together and make vesicles. And then you can increase the complexity of these, of, of these assemblies and add function by mixing and matching, putting these components inside vesicles to make cell-like components, all the way up to systems. Okay, so here's a cell, a system, if you like. And then you can go even further. So when, so, so when we published this um, five, five, four or five years ago, um, we stopped there. But of course, the complexity in biology doesn't stop there. It goes on to tissues and the organismal um, level. All right? So there's increasing complexity up here. And if we were to go straight up this axis, that's biology, if you like. But if you were to diverge away from these components or the way you put them together and become more like a chemist or more like an engineer you can put them together imagine putting them together in different ways you can imagine mutating them you can imagine redesigning totally new things then you become more of a synthetic biologist and this is synthetic biology space i think and the idea is can you make things like encapsulated complex systems that do things that they might, they might sense things they might produce drugs uh, they might act as um, supports for cell growth and so on and so forth um, and that leads me on to things like 3D cell culture and tissue engineering. Some people don't agree that this should be on here. It's a distinct discipline on its own. I agree with that uh, largely, but it can borrow from this, this approach in synthetic biology, I think, to a, to a large extent. And then we'll get on to protocell networks later on. So Doug's mentioned this. I've now explained it. I'm going to put a bit of flesh on it uh, by way of uh, expanding this introduction that I was asked to do. Uh, and I'm going to try and put flesh on it that isn't in this room and that you aren't going to see for the next couple of days. So the first bit of flesh is uh, Craig. So this is Craig Venter. And what Craig Venter did and published two years ago uh, in science was this idea that you can now synthetically make the whole genome of an organism. Right? And you can, so you can chemically make the pieces for that. You can stitch them together via bacteria and yeast and you can produce the whole chromosome. And then you can introduce it into, and he, he did it for a, a, a mycoplasma, and put his own watermarks and things inside that DNA. You can introduce that DNA into another strain of, my, uh, of mycoplasma, and that uh, computer-derived, if you like, DNA will boot up this cell, and the daughter cells produced will only have that DNA, that synthetic DNA in it, okay? So that was Craig Venter's approach, and he calls this uh, synthetic genomics. So we called it genome engineering. Um, then there's biomolecular engineering, and here's Jay Kiesling. And what, as many of you will know, this is artemisinin, which is not a prophylactic for, um, anti for, for malaria. It's an anti-malarial cure for malaria. The problem with giving people this cure, of course, 
in the developing world is they'll get malaria again, and it might be a nice way of making money if they had any money, but what Jay wanted to do, of course, was to give this to those people as cheaply as possible, uh, and it's an expensive drug to make synthetically, it's an expensive um, uh, natural product to harvest. So his idea was take the enzyme cascade, I think it's about 12 enzymes, from the plant, it's a sweet wormwood, um, take those enzymes and pop them into yeast and get yeast to produce this molecule. It turns out it can't produce this molecule completely. He produces a precursor for it and then finishes it off with synthetic chemistry. You might say that's metatic, me metabolic engineering, right? But people are heralding it as one of the successes of synthetic biology. So that's biomolecular engineering, in my view. What you're doing is you're taking natural enzymes, you're taking them out of context of the plant and putting them into a yeast to produce the drug more efficiently and more cheaply. This is Steen Rasmussen. What Steen does, um, he's interested in artificial life. Now I think this is right on the border of synthetic biology. So he says, well, let's forget about these biological bits here, but I do want to make systems like this, but I want to make my systems as chemical as possible. And one idea of his is that you can make a soap bubble, for want of a better uh, analogy. So you can make something made out of detergents that encapsulates things, so it's got that feature of biological systems, it's encapsulating stuff. And then he's going to put molecules on the outside that might sense and transduce light to couple to chemistry in the, in the middle of his soap bubble that produces carbohydrates. So you can imagine transducing light energy into chemical energy in a, in a, in a cell-like, in a bio-inspired, encapsulated vesicle, but it isn't biologically derived. And even the information store that he wants to put into this isn't DNA-based, okay? It's chemically based. So that's Steen Rasmussen and the Protocell project. There are books being written on this stuff now. This is Hagen Bailey from Oxford, and what Hagen is trying to do is again take synthetic droplets in this case, they're droplets of, of water in oil, and the boundary again is lipid, so he can put proteins into these boundaries. He's trying to, he's trying to um, make system sensing devices, a sequencing device, he's trying to DNA, uh, do se DNA sequencing in water droplets in oil, it's amazing. And he's actually having some success there, he's got a company doing this. But what he wants to do, he's build up whole systems of these droplets into, into networks that will pass information through them and sense and so on and so forth. So that's a development, I think, in some ways of protocells. And he was the one that actually said I should continue this uh, y-axis up further. Um, this is Andrew Turberfield. He's also at Oxford, he's a physicist. I could have put anybody there. I could have put a guy called Ned Seaman. I could have put Paul Rothermond and other people. What these guys do is they program DNA to assemble into two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. So they're using the information in DNA. They're using base pairing. They're using the fact that, you, that they form double-stranded structures. But they're forgetting about the genetic information that they store in DNA. They're using it as a, structural inf a, a, a store of structural information. And people have done amazing things um, with DNA origami, it's called now. You take a single-stranded piece of DNA, you raster, around it, uh, raster it onto a picture in a computer, and then you use small oligos to staple the, the, the single-stranded DNA together to make that picture. So you can, make, you can imagine having the Mona Lisa uh, in, the com in the computer, rastering a piece of DNA, or an in silico piece of DNA around the Mona Lisa, pegging it together with different oligos that you can type into, the, or the computer actually produces for you, emails off to the DNA synthesis company, you get 2,000 oligos back in the post, you mix them with your single-stranded DNA in a PCR instrument, heat it up, cool it down, and out pops a nanoscale Mona, Mona Lisa. So people can do that. It's extraordinary. People are making nanoscale boxes, um, people are making um, DNA machines out of these things now. People are trying to make DNA computers out of these things. It's a huge field. Is it synthetic biology? I don't know. Right? But it's an incredibly smart way of engineering with biological molecules. And unfortunately, they're doing much better than we are. This is us. 
um, because um, we work with peptides and proteins. So in, in DNA, you have this beautiful um, relationship, of, as we all know, between the bases, the sequence, base pairing, and the, and the structure of DNA. So you can do all the wonderful things that we can do in molecular biology, and now in DNA assembly, we can't do any of that yet in peptides and proteins because we don't understand the rules that link protein sequence and protein structure. That's what my group are trying to do. Why bother doing this? Why, uh, you know, why do we do it at all? Well, this is the epitaph of uh, this great man, Richard Feynman, from his, found on his back, blackboard in 1988. What I cannot create, I do not understand. And I think synthetic biology and this approach to engineering biological systems gives us a great opportunity to test our understanding of how we think they're put together, how they fold, how they function. So I think this is, this is becoming the mantra of lots of synthetic biologists. The idea is, I'm going to have a go at making it based on our understanding. And I, and I do fully subscribe to this, but as you'll see, we're quite aware of applic applications with protein engineering at the moment. But um, that's not true of all protein engineering. My type of protein engineering, we're some way off, but hopefully we'll get there. Um, we'd like to make useful things. So what I'm going to talk about in um, the next 15 minutes or so uh, is this idea of producing a, a toolbox full of protein-based components that we can use in different contexts. And what we've had to do, and I, I, and, and I think Dick and I see eye to eye on this, uh, in, in that, and, and you'll see, hopefully you'll see from Dick's talk as well, that you engineer on the basis of having a decent component set that you understand, that's standardized, that's well characterized. And often you have to produce those through a design cycle. And so there's lots of resonance, hopefully, in what we do as protein engineers and what synthetic biologists like Dick do um, with um, protein pathways and, or gene pathways and, and cells. So, and that basically wraps up what I was going to say on this slide, which is that what we wanted to come up with is a toolkit of peptides that were small. I mean, the average protein domain size is 150 amino acids. That's far too complex for me. Uh, I, want to be, I want to be able to make peptide bits that are 30 amino acids long that my peptide chemist can produce in the first instance in the, in the chemistry lab. And then we want to be able to make them out of proteinogenic amino acids so we can then take them into genes as, we, as, as, our, as the complexity of our system goes up. So we want to make them small. Um, we want to make them simplified. We want to remove some of the biological complexity. We want to make them independently folded. They've got to be orthogonal. That, that, that means that if I make one component, it should only interact with another component if I teach it to, if I, if I program it to. Otherwise, it should be orthogonal. Um, they've got to be predictable and reliable. They've got to do what we tell them to do or program to do them. And they've got to be very well characterized. And, and hopefully engineers will recognize this. We have a design cycle for doing this. So the idea is that we start by looking at protein sequences, that's PFAM, and protein structures, that's the PDB. So these are three-dimensional uh, folded structures of these linear sequences of, of proteins. We choose our target structures. They may be in this structure, or structural universe, the known structural universe, or they may be outside it. I'll talk about that right at the end if I have time. And then we analyze those sequences and structures, and we get rules that link sequence to structure, just as the DNA people have rules that link their sequences to their structures. And once we've done that, once we've got some targets, and once we've got some rules, we put those things into our design cycle. So we make our peptides by chemical synthesis. We analyze them by a whole slew of biophysical um, char uh, characterizations, culminating in X-ray crystallography and electron microscopy. Um, and then if, if we have a successful design, which we usually don't to start off with, they're usually insoluble or they're unstable, and we have to go through iterations of designs to make them better, or they, they're promiscuous. Um, we can then put them into PCOMP, that's our peptide components database. It's a bit like the Biobricks re repository. It's a lot smaller, right? um, but it's a bit like that. And we can also go into gene synthesis, as you'll see. And then once we put them into PCOMP and they're reliable, we can start thinking about applications. Um, we're interested in making switches so we can make sensors. We're interested in making multi-component biomaterials. We would love to make a mimic of the extracellular matrix that holds cells together. That's a kind of uh, a huge goal, and it's a multi-component network that it's not just a small number of things. It's, it's very complex. So we want to be able to build up the complexity of our systems in a component-based way. Um, and we also want to make nanoscale objects because they're interesting and fun and we can do things with them. 
Um, and this is the building block we've started to work with. We're branching out now, but we wanted something that was reliable, where we really had a chance of reading from sequence to structure. And I'm going to give you a bit of protein structure and chemistry now. So this is a ribbon diagram of a transcription factor. There's DNA. Here's a protein. So this is a dimeric protein that folds into an alpha helix, then binds to another copy of itself in this case, and that dimer then goes into bind DNA and switch DNA on. Um, we were interested in this bit, the dimerization domain or the, or the multimerization domain, because we want to use these small peptides to program self-assembly. We want to bring two, three, four, five proteins together to do new and interesting things. And the way we, uh, we understand this protein at the sequence level is that it has a repeat of hydrophobic and polar residues that goes HPP, HPPP. That's a seven residue repeat with hydrophobic space three and then four apart. And if you look down the jaws of this thing here and you spin this A through G, those first seven letters of the alphabet, out onto what's called a helical wheel, which is just the geometry of this projected into two dimensions, you go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or hydrophobic, polar, polar, hydroph hydrophobic, polar, polar, polar. So everything on this side is hydrophobic. Everything here is polar. So these are what are called amphipathic helices. They come together by the hydrophobic effect. Everything is water. So these hydrophobics try and avoid each other and make these dimeric units. They need to know that bit, of that, that bit of chemistry because that's the first principle that we use to put these proteins together. Um, there are more principles, and these are all out of acronyms from my lab. Sorry about that. But essentially, this, this interface is very intim intimate. It's not just a hydrophobic inter interface. It turns out that side chains come off that backbone, that helical backbone, they point um, from one helix and they go into a hole from a, a residue on another, a, a series of residues on another helix. So you've got a knob, as it's called by Crick, on one helix and a hole on another helix and they interjudicate rather intimately, which is very unusual in the protein world. And it means that the hydrophobic cores of these proteins are like jigsaw puzzles. And the jigsaw puzzles for different shaped proteins are different shapes, which means, again, we have these rules like G goes with C, A goes with T, but only with amino acids. And we know this because we've um, looked at all of the protein structures with this helix, helix motif. We're just representing that dimer here, there as this little cartoon. So this is one helix uh, linked to another helix with uh, hydrophobic interaction, this knobs into hole interaction. And we can, we can program that up, and we can look at the whole slew of 70,000 protein structures, and we can ask how, how many of these guys have um, this structure. And it turns out about 1,000 of them do. Right? But they don't just, just do this boring dimer thing. Some of them do dimers, trimers, tetramers, pentamers. Some of them make billiard ball shapes. Some of them make rings. So there's a whole slew of different protein structures encoded by that same pattern. So somehow there are some other rules built upon that HPP, HPPPP. And the reason I'm laboring this is that we're trying to get the same rules that the DNA guys have got in order to build proteins. So if we understand that amino acid one followed by two polars followed by amino acid two gives you a dimer, we've got a rule for protein folding. If you switch those around and you get a tetramer, we've got a different rule. Right? So this is a whole universe of protein structures that we might try and mimic, and they have a whole bunch of different functions. So these tend to hold together transcription factors. These here are efflux proteins. They have a hole in the middle of them. So it's 12 helices this time. There's a hole down the middle of them, and they eject uh, antibiotics through the periplasmic space of bacteria. So there's a whole bunch of functions associated with these different structures. If we can understand these structures, we can build these new functions. The problem is it's a bit like this. You've got this sem similar underlying pattern. You've got many peaks that you could scale, or many different structures. And if you're standing down here, you don't know which one's the highest one. You don't know which one to go for. Or if you're a physical scientist, you think about it in free energy terms. You, don't, you, you, want, you, want, you want to get down into this free energy minimum, but you might get trapped in other local minima. So you, we have to program our protein structures very carefully to get where we want to, to avoid and avoid other minima. And so a very long story short, we can do this. It turns out there are rules, as I've, I've already mentioned, there are different shaped jigsaw puzzle pieces that go into different shaped jigsaw puzzle holes in these 
um, the hydrophobic cause of these structures. So here's an example. You, you combine valine at the A position with leucine at the D position, you, you will get a dimer. Right? There are rules that allow you to knit different proteins together. So these polar residues can reach across each other and form salt bridges. So if you made this all positive and this all negative, you would have a Velcro type protein molecule. I mean, you can make those. There are, there are icing on the cake type rules that allow very specific interactions. This one's a hydrogen bonding interaction in the middle of dimers. The point is we have rules, just like G goes with C, A goes with T, we have rules for proteins. And to cut a very long story short from a brilliant bunch of people, and I just want to highlight this one, this is our latest paper, and it's out in ACS Synthetic Biology. This looks like it's going to be a smashing journal. It looks, looks really good. It's really eclectic. It covers the, the, the broad spectrum of, um, of, of synthetic biology, in my view. And they've accepted our paper, so it's got to be good. Um, and um, we've used all of these rules to make dimers, trimers, tetramers. We've used them to make... Uh, uh, obligate heterodimers, so we can bring protein A together with protein B in the presence of protein C and protein D and protein E and F, and they won't interact promiscuously. So we can teach these or program these peptides to do different things and partner appropriately. We can even do that with, with trimers. This is some old work that I did in California as a postdoc. You can get three different sequences to come together in a heterotrimer. And if I get a chance, I'll talk about new protein structures that you can make. This is a hexamer that hadn't been seen before, using similar sorts of rules. So now we've got some power, we can start doing things. We're going to use these as bricks, and we're going to try and build interesting things. Um, the first time, um, the, 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 I want to convince people that we can take our chemical peptides, because we made them proteinogenic, into the synthetic biology arena completely. So with Barbara Brodsky, we wanted to make a mimic of a protein structure that we haven't got, we don't understand, to bring together co three collagen strands. So collagen, of course, in eukaryotes, uh, is the, in eukaryotes is the, one of the major components of the extracellular matrix that knits cells together. And this, as people like Sam will, will know, is incredibly important in, in mimicking because you want to bring cells together in tissue engineering uh, approaches. Uh, we would love to make, make collagens or light materials out of a bacterial collagen because it doesn't have a hydroxyproline pro residue in it which dogs chemical synthesis of, of mammalian collagens. So we wanted to work with Barbara on this bacterial collagen that is a triple helix um, and it does bind cells, um, but it's stitched together, it's, it's nucleated by a small peptide that we don't understand. So she, what, what, what uh, Barbara does understand is that if she, puts, if she makes a gene construct of this thing without the peptides that hold it into the membrane of the bacterium, she finds that she can put this variable region at the N terminus but not the C terminus. So we took our trimeric coil coil, because it's a trimeric triple helix, and we put it at the N terminus of this sequence, the C terminus, and at both ends. And to cut a very long story short, what we found was that at the N-terminus of the C-terminus, this uh, building block nucleated the assembly of the collagens. But when we put it at both ends, it didn't work. Right? So we got a confused collagen helix here, but we got folded collagen helices when we, when we put them at the N-terminus of the C-terminus. Now, this is an important um, principle that we've learned by doing an experiment, because we want to build, build these into materials. We want to use these things, as you'll see later on, uh, to build long fibrous materials, but we want to use these to bring function, to, to uh, sew seeds together, uh, uh, knit cells together. Um, but we know we can't go this route because we confuse the protein, but we can go either of these routes. It's, it's an important engineering principle. Final bit. We would also like to mimic the extracellular matrix, I've already mentioned this, that knits um, cells together, or at least... Um, mammalian and eukaryotic cells, mammalian cells, sorry. So um, a lot of people have been working in this area, but they've been working with amyloids. So they take small peptides that form beta sheets, make beta fibrils, wrap around each other, and make gels like amyloids. We didn't want to work in the area for a whole bunch of reasons, um, mainly because we start working with alpha helices. But the problem with alpha helices is that, as, as I've described all along, they're blunt-ended assemblies. They're discrete objects. So we wanted to span this regime from the nanometer scale up to tens of microns 
with this small unit, how do we do it? Well, we had to invent another component. And the components that we invented are sticky-ended assemblies. So one helix marries another helix, but in a sticky-ended fashion. So this guy now combined to this guy, and you get fibrillogenesis over here. Now, this has an adva three advantages as far as I can see. First of all, unlike uh, the beta amyloid area, we have rules that link these sequences of structures. Secondly, it gives us an immense amount of um, control um, because it's a two-peptide system. It's peptide A marrying peptide B. If it was just peptide A that spontaneously self-assembled, we'd have no control. And the third reason is related to that. We can add in A star variants, you know, variants of this, to bring in function, as you'll see. And this has been worked out of the last 10 years by a huge team of people. They're brilliant. And to cut a long story short, it works. So there's our building block. And if I were to hold this, if I could hold this still, there'd be many tens, these are our fibres, many tens of these building blocks across here and many thousands of these building blocks across here. To cut another very long story short, we know how these assemble. It takes of the order of hours to days. We know their structure now to, uh, we have an, an eight angstrom cryo-electron microscopy uh, view of, of, of these structures. But what I wanted to show you was that from that understanding, we can vary the size of these fibres. We can make them um, thick and, and ordered, a bit thinner and less stable. We can make them um, windy and interacting just by changing the chemistry on the outside of those helical wheels that I showed you by rational design and engineering. And the, the final experiment I'm going to describe is where we've taken, this is the experiment we should have done, this is the experiment I mentioned right in the introduction, this is our non-bespoke general design. We should have done this 10 years ago. Right? And we, should have been, we should have known about synthetic biology 10, 15 years ago, and we would have, we would have done it this way. And the, because we, we know that these bits of the helices hold these helices together, but we didn't know anything about the chemistry on the outside, so what we should have done is made it as bland as possible. And when you make it as bland as possible, essentially what you get is a series of peptides that upon heating, look at this one here, from the fridge to 37 degrees, it gels. And that's great, because now we've got control over gelation, and we can see those gels, again, in the electron micrograph, and we can also grow cells on those gels. We now know that we can add peptides that bring cell binding uh, moieties to these gels, and we can grow different types of cells on these gels. And we know that the cells ingress into the gels, so we can grow three-dimensional cultures. Um, this, is th this is the bullet galaxy. Two, two, it's actually two galaxies um, smashing into it, going through each other. And apparently these cl cl clever astronomers, can, they can see um, the, the real matter interacting, right, for these, these pink bits. But as the galaxies go through each other, they can also see the dark matter, which doesn't interact with each other, so it comes out first, right, as the two galaxies are going this way and this way. So um, the reason I've chosen this slide is because there's a very smart protein scientist called Willie Taylor who believes there's a whole dark matter galaxy of protein structures that biology hasn't explored yet. Makes perfect sense, right? So biology uses the same protein structures time and time again. Makes perfect sense. But there should be some other proteins out there that possibly we could find. And here's one. So here's the top row of our periodic table, which I kind of explained before, of our coil coils. Dimers through pentamers, we've seen all of those. There's that efflux protein, that the dodecamer that I've described. There is an engineered um, serendipitous uh, heptamer, um, but there are no hexamers. We wanted to fill this space because, not just because of coil coil butterfly collecting, but because um, these things, as I described earlier, all have holes in them. If you've got a protein with a hole in it, you can do a whole load of things, as it were. You can, um, you can make enzymes, in principle. You can make ion channel proteins, all from a basic engineering fundamental um, stance. So we took our tetramer, CC tet from our uh, basis set, or our, um, this should be called CC tet, uh, our toolkit, and we did a very simple experiment. So there's the hydrophobic residues, right? There's the, here's the actual structure, there's the cartoon, there are the hydrophobic residues that knit this tetramer together. 
And we did a simple experiment. We moved one of those charged residues that I described makes salt bridges across this structure. We just moved it to the outside and we moved one of those innocuous alanines, which is also slightly hydrophobic, in its place. So we did that experiment. All right? So just swapping those two around. And this is the advantage of having a simple engineered system. You can, make, you can do simple experiments. And this is really nice. When we did that, we made this hydrophobic seam larger, and now we get the hexama that nature doesn't appear to have discovered, or at least we haven't seen it in nature yet. Um, when you look at it in detail, it's got a hole in the middle of it. This hole is beautifully defined. It's about five to six angstroms. Um, it's lined at the moment by hydrophobic residues. It does appear to pass water. Looks like an aquaporin, actually. Um, and we can do chemistry inside it. These are crystal structures where we've taken that one of those hydrophobic residues and we've put charged residues, and we've put another charged residue, negatively charged, positively charged, and now you can mix those, and you get a beautiful array of alternating positive type and negative type. So we can play chemistry games inside this design protein structure, but we can do it with confidence because we've designed this thing from first principles. We know what every residue does. It's not like engineering natural protein. Uh, it's got water going through it, or something going through it, even though it's hydrophobic. Um, this, Susan hopefully will be interested in this, this protein uh, is a, is a, has some lipase type activity. It chops up um, fatty acid esters. And that's about it. So hopefully I've convinced you that we can work in this synthetic biology area. It's kind of a broad, eclectic mix of different things. Um, we're trying to um, develop PCOM. We'd love c contributors. We've had to revise, I didn't talk about this, some of our understanding of core coil assembly. Um, we've got, now got this basis set, all this toolkit, and we're applying it in chemical biology and synthetic biology and to build new materials. And we're discovering new things along the way. And these are the brilliant people that did the work. And I've run out of time, so I won't mention them in, by person.